Hi, my name is Rob Sturman. I'm an associate professor in the School of Mathematics at the University of Leeds. Uh, and in this short video, I just want to talk to you about fractals, uh, what they are, how they're made or how they're created and how to describe them and why we're interested in them at all. First, here's an interesting motivational question. How long is the coastline of Great Britain? Uh, and this was a question that was studied by a mathematician called Lewis Fry Richardson, uh, who was one of the forerunners of weather forecasting and was also interested in uh, international conflict and postulated that maybe two countries were more likely to be at war if the border between them was longer. So he was interested in the idea of how to calculate the length of a border between countries or um, the coastline of a country with some accuracy. And so here's one attempt at it. I've got a ruler um, that's uh, 200 kilometers long. And so I put one end of the ruler on uh, one uh, piece of the coastline and I try and put the other end as far away as I can on the coastline. And I move around the coast like this uh, with rulers of the same length. I count up the number of rulers that I've used uh, and um, multiply it by the length. And that gives me the length of, of coastline in total. But if I use a shorter ruler, you can see that I can now pick up more details of the shape of the coastline. I can go into this first here. Uh, and if I uh, compute the total length now, it's gone up a little bit. But if I keep on making my ruler shorter and shorter, I pick up more and more resolution, more and more detail. And again, the length seems to get longer. And Richardson asked, I wonder if this increase of length will continue as I make my ruler shorter, or will I get to some limit, which is really the length of the coastline? And what Richardson found was that, in fact, as you make your ruler shorter and shorter, and you go into more and more beaches, into rocks on beaches, into wrinkles on rocks on beaches, actually, this total length increases apparently without bound, and that coastlines are, in some sense, infinitely long. There's a little bit something strange about that, though, because coastlines, of course, are different. Um, if you think about what the coast of South Africa looks like, it's extremely smooth compared to the very, very wrinkled coastline of Norway. And so simply saying that coastlines have infinite length, if you think about all of the wrinkles in them, doesn't quite uh, uh, do justice to the difference between these two, um, these two types of coastline. So one man that uh, looked into this in some detail is um, very closely connected with the idea of a fractal, and that's Benoit Mandelbrot. Uh, and he really uh, looked at the, the, the connections between fractal objects, and we'll describe what these are exactly very shortly, and the real world. And so looking in a little more detail um, at these uh, uh, coastlines and lengths, um, he plotted graphs like this, and this is a log log plot. So here, um, we, uh, we expect the gradient of these lines, which are straight in a log-log plot, to tell us how wrinkled uh, a particular coastline is, how complicated uh, these, um, uh, these ins and outs are. And you can see on this graph that the coast of, of uh, Great Britain, the west coast in particular, uh, is quite wrinkled. It's a steeper slope than the South African coast, which is almost flat, indicating that it's extremely smooth. Now, you might expect that mathematicians had thought about uh, wrinkled and smooth curves before, and you'd be quite right. Uh, here's a construction, a very well-known one, called the Koch snowflake uh, from more than 100 years ago. And I think you can see intuitively how to construct it right away. Uh, you take an equilateral triangle, and the middle third of a line, you remove it, and you replace it with the other two sides of an equilateral triangle, and do that on all three sides. And that gets you from the triangle to this nice star. And then you repeat that process on every existing side of this star uh, to replace the middle third with two sides of another triangle. And as you can continue this process, this gets more and more complicated, more and more wrinkled, if you like. Now, this construction, uh, which is by Helga von Koch, uh, was not really looking for any properties of fractals and fractal dimension, but trying to play with the ideas of continuous functions and what it means for something to be continuous or differentiable. And in fact, uh, it can be shown that the, the curve that you get if you continue this process forever is continuous, but differentiable nowhere. In other words, you can draw this shape without taking your pen off the paper. But in some sense, there are no, there are no portions of straight line left. It's all corner. So it's a, it's a kind of an interesting object. Uh, here's a related object, which is constructed in a similar sort of way. Um, it's called the Sierpinski Triangle, again, from just over 100 years ago, uh, described by Vaclav Sierpinski. 
And the idea is that you begin with a black equilateral triangle. And then repeatedly, whenever you see a black equilateral triangle, you remove from the center um, this equilateral triangle that points downwards. And so after I've removed this triangle here, I've got three black triangles left. And on the next stage, I remove the middle triangle from each of those. And again, I just do this again and again and again. And as I do this forever, then I have the object called the Chierpinski triangle. Now, I said that mathematicians had, had got there first before um, the, the uh, Mandelbrot and the other people interested in fractals. Um, inevitably, artists had got there before mathematicians. Uh, this is a picture of the Cathedral of Agnagni in Italy, um, built in 1104. The floor of this cathedral is not quite as old. It's only about 100 years later, though. It was built around 1200, this floor in the crypt. And you can see, if you look carefully, exactly this design of uh, the Sierpinski Triangle um, uh, inlaid in mosaic in the floor of this cathedral. So people, uh, humans had already for nearly a thousand years understood the aesthetic beauty of these sorts of objects. Uh, here's a related one. You can see how this is related. The Sierpinski Carpet. It's a square version of the Sierpinski Triangle. You start with a square and you simply remove the central square and you do this repeatedly uh, until you get uh, the, the Sierpinski carpet, which has got infinitely holes in it uh, of increasingly small size. We might move up a dimension and create something called the Menga sponge. So it's a similar sort of process. Begin with a cube and take out of that cube the central cube from every face and the central cube from the very middle of the cube. And what you've uh, have left uh, is a whole lot of cubes stuck together, if you like, with these big uh, cubes from faces removed. And then you remove the central cube again from each face and the center. And you keep doing that again and again and again. So this is uh, the Menger sponge due to Karl Menger from uh, not quite 100 years ago. Uh, this was uh, um, described. Now, um, we were part of a project to build these things out of paper cubes uh, not long ago. We have a nice model of a Menger sponge or a Menger cube coffee table in the School of Mathematics at Leeds. Uh, you are very welcome uh, to come and see it. Uh, it's actually constructed of a whole load of paper cubes. There's no glue involved at all. Uh, you make these uh, uh, little cubes and you stick them together just using uh, paper tabs and the whole thing will stand under its own weight. Uh, it's now encased in, uh, in Perspex to stop the coffee uh, from uh, making it go soggy. The Menga cube and all fractals have some really interesting mathematical properties. Um, I'll just list some here and then maybe we'll talk in a little detail about them. Each face of this Menga sponge or Menga cube is a Sierpinski carpet. I think you can tell that by looking at it. This Menga cube has zero volume. In other words, it weighs nothing. Now, of course, our coffee table weighs something. It's only a model of the real mathematical object, but the mathematical object has zero volume and yet it has infinite surface area. So it weighs nothing, but it would take you an infinite amount of paint to uh, paint all the surface area inside uh, and out. All of these bits that we've removed gives you more and more surface area, and there's infinitely uh, much of it. And its dimension is somewhere between two and three. We're really used to thinking about things having it being in two dimensions, flat shapes, or three dimensions, like this cube. Uh, but this formally has a dimension uh, which is bigger than two and less than three. That's a fractal. Its dimension uh, is some fractional number, which is not an integer. So let's just try and explain uh, these properties, why we get these uh, things. So first of all, zero volume is kind of easy to understand. You'll probably imagine we didn't make our coffee table by starting with a huge cube and started uh, cutting out uh, bits. We started with uh, uh, lots and lots of little cubes, and then we stuck them together. And I think you can see that if you start that way around, you begin with one cube. And to make the next level up, to make a cube uh, with these holes in, we're going to we're going to stick them together in this way. I've got one cube missing from every face, six faces, and I've got one cube missing from the center. So all together there, uh, I have 20 cubes left uh, out of the 27, three by three by three, that would have made a solid cube. Uh, once you've made this out of 20 of these, uh, you make 20 of these, 20 copies of these, and then you stick those together in this uh, structure here. Once you've got those, you make 20 of those, and you stick those together. So in terms of the volume, if we call this first guy here a level zero Menga sponge, uh, then I've just got one cube, and it fills the entire space of one cube. 
at my level one, the next stage of this construction, I have 20 cubes and it takes up the space of 27, three times three times three. At level two, I need to have 20 copies of this, which was 20 of the original. So I have 20 squared cubes in the space of uh, nine cubed, that's 729 cubes, and I can uh, keep going. Uh, in the end, I find that I have at level n, I've always got 20 to the n cubes taking up the space where there should be 27 to the n. And so the volume of this thing is the fraction 20 to the n over 27 to the n as n tends to infinity as I go, uh, as I keep doing this procedure. And I think you can see that 27 to the n grows much quicker than 20 to the n. And so formally, this limit is zero. There is no volume left uh, in, this, in this process for the Menger sponge. The surface area is a little more complicated. Um, and uh, I've written down a formula here for the number of faces that you can see in the level n Menger sponge. And it's, uh, let's call it a n. It's twice 20 to the n plus four lots of eight to the n. And I'll leave for you uh, that for you to think about why this might be. We can check it because if I put n equals zero into this expression, I get two times 20 to the zero plus four times eight to the zero. And that's just six. Yes, of course, there are six faces here. And maybe you want to go back uh, a couple of slides earlier and just count the faces here. You should find there's 72 in the level one. Uh, and indeed, that fits with this formula. To prove it in general, you might like to think about how to show this using mathematical induction uh, if you've met that already. We need to scale the number of faces that we see by the volume of the cube. And so we take this expression for a n and divide it by 9 to the n. And you can see that because I've got a 20 to the n here, when I divide it by 9 to the n, I still have something which increases without bound as n increases. So the surface area really is infinite. It's extraordinary. Infinite surface area, but zero volume. Now let's just talk about dimension. This is the thing that really makes it a fractal. Uh, there's lots of different ways to define dimension, and I'm going to pick one of them here uh, called box counting dimension. It's a simple enough idea. What we want to know is how many boxes, n, of fixed size, epsilon, so epsilon, the Greek letter, we like to use Greek letters in, in mathematics, do I need to cover an object? And in particular, as the boxes that I cover my object with get smaller, I need more boxes to cover my object. How many more is the question? And then what I want to work out is I take the logarithm of the number of boxes I need, divide it by the logarithm of one over the size. So one over the size is getting bigger as the size is getting smaller. The number of boxes is getting bigger. And how does that work in ratio when I take their logarithms and I ask the boxes to go as small as possible? Let's do an example with that, and I'll do this on paper. So let's see how the box counting dimension works in this very simple example. Uh, I've just taken a rectangle. Uh, we know the answer is going to be that this is dimension 2. Uh, it's got size A and B. And so for box counting dimension, what I want to do is cover it in a grid of boxes, uh, which I'll just sketch in red. And we say that these boxes will have size epsilon. So in other words, their, their width and their height will be epsilon. And now what I want to know is how many boxes do I need to cover this rectangle completely? So how many bo red boxes are full uh, for size epsilon? And I think we can see that in this direction, how many boxes will we need? Well, as epsilon gets smaller, we need more and more. And in particular, in this horizontal direction, we will need a divided by epsilon, and in the vertical direction, we'll need b divided by epsilon. And so that is going to be my number of boxes, n of epsilon, a, b over epsilon squared. And so now all I have to do is put this into the expression for uh, box counting dimension and let epsilon tend to zero. So I have here um, the limit as epsilon goes to zero, n of epsilon is a b over epsilon squared. So I've got the logarithm of a b divided by epsilon squared divided by the logarithm of one over epsilon. Now I'm going to use some properties of logarithm uh, to simplify uh, things here. We know properties of log like log a b is log a 
plus log b and so I can uh, change log a b over epsilon squared into log a b minus the log of epsilon squared but I think you also know that I can bring down that 2 this is minus 2 log epsilon and similarly in the denominator uh, log of 1 over epsilon is like log of epsilon to the minus 1 so that's minus log of epsilon and now you can see uh, I've got two terms log a b over minus log epsilon but when epsilon tends to 0 uh, log epsilon tends to something very negative minus infinity and so uh, the log a b which is a constant divided by uh, that very big number will tend to 0 and over here I've got a log epsilon that will cancel and a minus 2 and a minus sign so this is simply equal to 2 and that's exactly what we expected uh, the dimension of a rectangle is 2. Let's go back and uh, now do this same calculation for something more interesting uh, like the Sierpinski triangle. So that's the simple case of a rectangle let's now repeat that procedure for a more complicated case and let's take the Sierpinski triangle for an example. So if I think of a triangle of side one, and I think of a box of size one, of course, I just need one box to cover this triangle. If I move to the next stage of the construction, uh, I've got now these three triangles and they have side a half. So if I take my box to have side a half, then I need exactly three of them to cover uh, this uh, stage of the construction. Going to the next level, I can halve the size of my box again to one over four. And now I've got nine triangles. And so I need nine boxes to cover it. And as I keep doing the procedure, um, I keep halving the size of my box. So epsilon at the nth stage will be 1 over 2 to the n. Meanwhile, I've had to triple the number of boxes that I use each time. And so at the nth stage, I've got 3 to the n boxes. So if I put those quantities into my expression for the dimension, uh, you can see that measuring uh, this uh, ratio log n over log 1 over epsilon as epsilon tends to 0 is the same as looking at the limit as n tends to infinity. And I've got log 3 to the n over log of 1 over 1 over 2 to the n, so log of 2 to the n. And by a property of logarithms, log of 3 to the n is n log 3, log 2 to the n is n log 2, and the n's will cancel. I can forget about the limit, and I just get log 3 over log 2, which is this number, an irrational number, somewhere between 1 and 2. So this Sierpinski triangle is something somehow bigger than a line, but not as big as a two-dimensional shape. It is somewhere in the middle. It is a fractal. I'll leave you to think about if you can compute what the fractal dimension of the Menger cube would be by exactly the same process. Now, why are we interested in fractals at all? Well, for one thing, it is the mathematical language of real life geometry. The world is not made up of circles and perfect triangles and oblongs and, and uh, parallel pipeds. It is made up of things uh, which have different properties at different scales, not just coastlines like this, but other objects like uh, like this broccoli, like lightning, like uh, mountains and cliff sides, and actually almost anything made up of some natural process uh, where things happen at different scales. So understanding fractal properties uh, is a massively important thing in applied mathematics in lots and lots of different guises. In fact, you can use the ideas of fractal geometry to build and understand lots of useful things. So here, for example, is an aerial. And the idea here is that we're trying to get as much length as possible into a, a fixed amount of area. And so we have this self-similar sort of structure that mirrors very much the Shipinski uh, carpet. Or people have used fractal ideas to make hydrophilic materials. So this is material that will repel water. And what you'd like is for this to have as much surface area as possible um, on a flat uh, surface. And so at lots of different scales, uh, there is um, this fractal wrinkling going on. And I think it's well known that our lungs are structured in a similar way. The lungs are trying to uh, have as much respiratory uh, action as possible. And so uh, they're, they're, they've evolved to have um, uh, as much surface area as possible within a fixed volume uh, in our chest uh, cavity. So again, all sorts of uh, scientists and mathematicians need to understand this sort of uh, properties of fractal structures uh, to, uh, uh, to understand the properties of both invented and natural things. 
Of course, you don't have to be interested in, in applications of mathematics to, to, to like the idea of this. Fractals are also um, beautiful objects, very deep in terms of their complexity and universal. They're easy to find in all sorts of simple, pure mathematical equations, and they are just fun to think about. This object is really well known. It's the Mandelbrot set. It comes out of very simple, complex dynamics. I've said simple and complex there. Um, very simple in the sense of straightforward to write down, complex in the sense of involving complex numbers. So really, I think if you're interested in any of these ideas, um, whether it's the pure mathematical side of describing and understanding these uh, structures in a formal sense, or the applied mathematics, how you can use these sorts of ideas to understand the real world around us, you should consider doing a mathematics degree. And if you choose to do it at the University of Leeds, uh, one of the modules I teach at the moment is computational mathematics. And I'll be delighted uh, to teach you how to implement the sort of procedures to understand and describe and characterize these sorts of objects uh, using a computer uh, and doing computational programming. Um, that's it for me for now. Uh, thanks for listening.